The Santa Barbara Public Library has come a long way from its humble beginnings. In 1870, before Sarah Plummer started the lending library and stationary depot, there was nothing. From the 2017, The Library Book, author Susan Miles Golbranson. Sarah Plummer received her education at Female College of Worcester in Massachusetts in the early 1860s. When teaching art in New York City, she became ill with pneumonia. A friend told her about Santa Barbara's climate as a good recovery environment. During her second year in town, Plummer was thrown from a horse carriage in the hills of Montecito. Reading would have made her recovery easier, but Santa Barbara had few books, no library, not even a bookstore. This was nothing new. Thirty years earlier, Richard Henry Dana wrote about the short supply in two years before the mass. Richard Henry Dana is best known for being the author of the book Two Years Before the Mast. Dana was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1815, came from sort of an a intellectually elite family, uh, attended Harvard, um, but while he was at Harvard, he contracted the measles, which uh, severely affected his eyesight, and basically he was laid up for about a year. And by the end of that time, um, one, I think he was bored stiff, and two, his doctor recommended a sea voyage to, uh, for him to regain his health. So he signed on to the Brig Pilgrim, which was engaged in the hide and tallow trade between the East Coast and California, and off he went on a voyage that took three months around Cape Horn to California. And their first port of call was Santa Barbara. The sun came up bright, and we set royals, sky sails, and studding sails, and run a fair way for Santa Barbara. The first impression which California had made upon us was very disagreeable. The open roadstead of Santa Barbara, anchoring three miles from the shore, running out to sea before every southeaster, landing in a high surf, with a little dark looking town a mile from the beach, and not a sound to be heard or anything to be seen. Such a dearth was there of these latter articles that anything, even a little child's storybook or the half of a shipping calendar, appeared like a treasure. I actually read a jest book through from beginning to end in one day, as I should a novel, and enjoyed it very much. At last, when I thought there was no more to be got, I found at the bottom of Old Schmidt's chest, Mandeville, a romance by Godwin in five volumes. This I had never read, but Godwin's name was enough, and after the wretched trash I had devoured, anything bearing the name of a distinguished intellectual man was a prize indeed. I bore it off, and for two days I was up early and late, reading with all my might and actually drinking in delight. It is no extravagance to say that it was like a spring in a desert land. Richard Henry Dana, 1835. The continued daily walks and unflagging interest in the new plant life on the beach and the foothill region and the mountain slopes were constantly attracting, filling, and feeding the mind, thus greatly assisting in regaining strength and vigor. When the flora became less in evidence, when the ground grew dry, a growing hunger for books and literary companionship took possession of my thoughts. I began to ask myself why we in the far-off region should not have some literary center. This thought quickened into a determination. I wrote to my cousin in New York, stating the need of establishing a literary center and a public library, and my determination to make a start for that purpose. Back came the word. A happy thought to take up the work of establishing a public library. It will be both a light and illuminating work. The next steamer will bring you a box of 200 or more of good miscellaneous books. My leading care during this decade was for the library and its value to the community. The time came for it to be merged into a larger library. It had done its good work during a crucial period of Santa Barbara's new growth, and what better surrender towards the present result of a fine public library, keeping pace with the city's growth? Sarah Plummer. 1870. The library was really successful and continued to operate under her direction until uh, she married in 1880 and moved away. And it's sort of funny, she married a person who she shared an interest with in botany, a teacher named John Lemon. And for their honeymoon, 
They uh, took off for the wilds of the Arizona Territory to study botany. And when they were down there, they ended up staying in a ramshackle cabin that supposedly had once belonged to a horse thief. And this cabin was really bare bones. Um, the cabin only had one quote unquote window, and that was a hole in the wall, which they could close at night by stuffing it with paper. Uh, the door was made out of barrel staves, and um, the uh, nearest water was almost a mile away. And they also had to watch out for Gila monsters and poison snakes. So it sounds like quite an adventurous honeymoon. Um, Sarah never really came back to Santa Barbara. Uh, she became well known for her paintings, especially of plant life. And as a matter of fact, she was instrumental in getting the poppy named the state flower of California. Sarah Plummer Lemon died in 1923, nationally known for her botanical work and her paintings, but best known here in Santa Barbara for starting the first lending library. The collection was purchased in 1874 by Colonel W. W. Hollister. The 1500 volume collection, including the bound files of the Santa Barbara Gazette, which was a gift of Charles Fernald, was given to Santa Barbara Lodge No. 156 of the Independent Order of the Oddfellows. The Oddfellows fell on hard times and it was decided the library was a luxury too expensive to maintain. But residents, led by a cottage hospital founder, Mary Ashley, banded together and saved the library. In 1882, Mayor Peter Barber and the Santa Barbara City Council issued a proclamation establishing the first free public library under the city's management. 24 years later, Francis Lynn became library director and served until 1943. From the 2017 The Library Book, author Betsy J. Green. When Lynn arrived in the library in 1906, the library was just one room. A year and a half later, the little library doubled in size. In 1914, a $50,000 grant was given to the library by the Carnegie Corporation, officially designating the Santa Barbara Public Library a Carnegie Library. The original design for the library was sketched by Eastern architect Henry Hornbostel before being modified to fit Santa Barbara by Francis W. Wilson with the help of Francis Lynn. To Lynn, a library was not just a repository of reading materials. It was a countywide community resource. As the library neared completion, it was decided to open the library when the children returned to school in August of 1917. With her typical can-do spirit, Lynn said she considered that the monumental task of moving all the books to the new library in fruit crates loaned by local companies was the greatest adventure of the year. The library opened on August 27, 1917. Santa Barbara News Press, 1917. Without ceremony, the doors of the new library were open to the public at 9 o'clock this morning, and the libraries began lending and receiving books over the improvised desk in the big reading room. All about the great reading room, there were signs of unfinished work. From other parts of the building came the sounds of hammers, and busy workmen and carpenters in aprons, and painters with brushes and pails now and then passed in the library, among the librarian and the patrons at the reading tables or the book racks. The library was open today before the building is finished so that students who begin their fall term of school today may not be hindered in their work by the lack of library accommodations. That same month, young men of Santa Barbara began leaving to serve on the World War I battlefronts of Europe, and the local labor pool began to shrink. As the community rallied to support the troops, Lynn responded by setting up tables in the library that she filled with books and magazines on timely topics such as the history of the war in Europe, conserving food, and making useful items and clothing for American soldiers. On Christmas Eve, as the war to end all wars raged in Europe, residents found solace at the library as they listened to carolers and Christmas stories while wood fires crackled in the massive fireplaces. Happy 
how core it is in the central part of the, physically in the central part of the city. Just the, the courthouse, the library, the theater, the Arlington, the Granada, the, this is such a central part of the, the community. It was one of the first buildings in neo-colonial Spanish style in Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara City Hall was completed in 1925 before the earthquake, which badly damaged this building. The new City Hall was just fine. The uh, earthquake of June 29, 1925 really did quite a bit of extensive damage in Santa Barbara. Some of the larger buildings in town, such as the uh, Arlington Hotel or the San Marcos building, were basically totally destroyed. Now, one of the buildings that was heavily damaged was the public library. Its west wall, that's the wall that would have faced uh, State Street, uh, basically collapsed. The east wall also was heavily damaged, and as you can imagine, the contents of the building, uh, books flying off the shelves, etc. So the library was uh, basically unusable. It took only one month for library staff and volunteers to salvage and move 500 boxes of books to a temporary library that was opened in the Spalding Stables at the corner of Chapala and Sola Street. One year later, the library that we know today was reopened. The library has seen two world wars, the Great Depression, and numerous natural disasters. It has both carried and been carried by the community. The library has demonstrated that it can withstand challenges and continue to evolve with the test of time. Things are changing so quickly that I, I, I can't even imagine 20 years from now or 50 years or never mind 100 years. I have also heard time and again, the library's on its way out, the library's dead. When paperback books came out, that was gonna be the end of libraries. When, when computers came out, that was gonna be the end of libraries. It doesn't happen. And I think part of it is that sense of, this is a resource that has so much meaning for people for so many different reasons. It's so many things to so many people. Wherever it goes, I think, I think libraries will survive. No matter what decade you're in, the library is about access, education, equitability. But today it's shifted its course into not just being about those things, not just being about the collections you see in here, but so much more outward focused and building the community that we're in. We're very focused on making sure that our mission aligns with the mission of our community and how we can make them stronger. It made the idea of the cornerstone of democracy really important. And I really feel like this library belongs to the community. It's important that it's here. This is a community resource that is absolutely necessary to the uh, vitality of a community and to the education of the children in the community, as well as continuing education for older folks too. Um, it's a no-brainer. Our libraries, our public libraries, are one of the central institutions of this country and help to keep it uh, strong and independent and free. And they work really hard to address current needs, to uh, support the educational and cultural life of the community, and in doing so, they're really hubs of the community, gathering places. So it's so many things to so many different people. One of the things, though, that I value in it is that it's a, it's a community coming together place. It's very much the epitome of democracy in a, in a community. In the country today, there's just so many pressures and so many changes and so many things happening, and I think a sense of community really helps people feel grounded. Service to the community, 
and being a, and a constantly evolving service that, that meets the needs of today, not just the needs that used to exist in the past, is I think something that my father was involved in, in planting that seed. And, and it's great to see how it's grown into this wonderful tree. If you live here, you care about your community in a way that's different than other places because you can see that it matters. There have been generations of people who have invested in this community and that's why it's the jewel that it is. It's a testament to the kind of people who moved to this area. And the, um, I think there was, even from the early days, um, a certain amount of enterprise and wealth that came to this community. And those people valued um, learning, education, having access to uh, cultural amenities. And I think the library was, was a really core part of that. when they started an orchestra in this town and when they, you know, when theater started in this town. I think all of those things came on the heels of the library as a core kind of element. The library used to have a wonderful music library, both in the days of LPs and, and they also had music scores. I can remember utilizing the library for that. And one other thing that I really enjoyed was the albums. As teenagers, and we came here as, as teenagers, wanted to go to where the music was. We had uh, six turntables for people to listen to music. The only music we had, of course, was on those big platters. But yeah, the Art and Music Library was a lot of fun and a lot of activity. In the old Art and Music area that was completely separate from the rest of the library, and that really speaks to the the fact that this community really valued the arts and wanted to have a separate section entirely devoted to art and music and drama and, you know, the full range of stuff. It was really quite a lovely space. As a 13-year-old with a deepening, near-religious devotion to music of all stripes, I remember being magnetized by not only books, but the Central Library's healthy collection of LPs and discovering Miles Davis's album, Nefertiti. I think discovering the records when I was a teenager was really kind of interesting. You know, I didn't, that was just completely unguided, and all you had to do was grab a record out of the stack and sit over, go with the phonographs, put the headphones on. Those kind of things just pop into my head randomly, you know. There's, so there's not one experience, it's just a, a whole mosaic of, of memories. And My father was the library director for the city of Santa Barbara and the county of Santa Barbara. So the library was my after school home. And so after school and after sports, I would come down to the library and hang out and wait for my father to be done with work and give me a ride home. I thought he read books. I thought he, you know, that was his job, was to read books and figure out what kind of books went on the, on the shelves. And then he would bring me books home and say, here, read this. And I, I actually got kind of lazy as a reader as a result. You know, while he was alive, to his dying days, he was constantly giving me books. My father was a reader. Um, my mother was a newspaper reader. And we came here a lot as a kid. I remember coming up on what is now the Anna Kappa side. They had a special entrance for the children there, and that's where we entered this library at and it was the best place you know it was a lot of little nooks and crannies and we always felt like we were snaking our way through the library that we were sneaking up on the adults i'm from a working class family we didn't have any books in the house i'm the only first one of our family ever to go to college and so as a kid i grew up in peekskill new york on the hudson river our library meant a great deal to me 
because it was a kind of uh, escape from the house. And uh, I could wander at will and pick books off the shelf and it, it, was, uh, it was huge. I remember my girlfriends and I, we would walk from the west side of Santa Barbara. We're all natives. We walked from the west side of Santa Barbara to the downtown library, library here. And we would go into the children's department. We would walk in off of the Anacapa side, walk into the children's department with armfuls of books. And then we would walk home. <laughs> that was our standard of what we used to do when we were little. I have so many amazing memories. I mean, I like to say that the public library made me, and so um, my life has just transpired through the public library, but I would say some of my more recent fond memories are with my own children and taking them to their libraries as they grew up, and even today they come and visit me, but especially when they're in that zero to five years old where they would come to the library and for the first time really explore their world. We had this dream of moving it to the lower level and taking up that entire space to provide um, a better opportunity for kids. I just thought it should be bright and inviting and inspirational. I used to beg my mom to take me to the library and I wanted the kids here to beg their parents to take them. I'm thinking of children. If we didn't have all this for these children growing up, how would they go on to being a well-rounded student at a, at a high school or a junior high or just getting through kindergarten or trying to learn to read? If we weren't there for them, who's going to be? My mother was a children's librarian, so I grew up in libraries. When I was on the desk, I did reader's advisory, and children grew up coming to me for what should I read next, and that was actually the most fun. There were people who brought their, ch brought their kids once, one or two times a week for years, and there was one particular family with, that she had two daughters, and they, she would come in all the time, and the daughters grew up reading, and I advised them. They read very well. When they moved over to the adult books, one of the girls would bring me to, over to the children's desk to show me what she was reading, to ask me what I thought of. And you know, I would cross my fingers. I was hoping that I'd read one, and then I could say, oh, you know what? You'll love this one. Because, you know, and oh, you know, I meant to get to that one. But anyway, she, would, she was so used to running her books by me um, that she did as a high school kid too. And it was all based at getting better service for the public. And we, we did a bang up job. Uh, it sounds so corny, but I loved helping people. And I always felt like I did that. So when I went home, I always thought, well, I made a difference today. And I thought how lucky I was that I could work in a place where I could think that. So the library really has something from, you know, zero to 100. When you're zero to five, your early literacy skills, you're learning how to be in the world, you can do that at the library. As you continue to grow, we're here for your children and their entire educational path. Come to our homework help. You know, come read with a dog if you're a reluctant reader. You know, as a teenager, we want this to be a safe place for you to hang out, geek out, mess around. <laughs> and then going on into your adult years, civic engagement happens at the library. This is where we teach our community how to be informed citizens, how to make decisions, and having a place in the community that's safe to do that especially in today's world, is so important. And the library has really taken on that role and continues to grow that role. And then as you go on in your year, senior citizens, you know, we've worked really hard this year. Some of our librarians especially have made a focus of making sure that our over 55 have resources, not just in the building, you know, the one-on-one -on -one computer coaching. I mean, what is this tablet and what do I do with it? Come here, we'll help you. But going out to them, having book discussions, just you know, libraries make people feel human. Libraries help people um, discover themselves and the world around them.
The Santa Barbara Public Library was created 100 years ago to fill the need for a space where the community could come to read and learn or to just sit and contemplate. Today, the library is still that space. The Santa Barbara Public Library Central Branch is one of the city's beloved jewels. It is the home of almost 120,000 books, of the passions and aspirations of our city's children. It is the architect of readers and writers. It is our sanctuary. It is our history. And it most certainly is our future. But the library is not just the physical space anymore, right? We have, it's a 24-7 virtual space. Technology has really made us uh, be nimble and flexible because it's our responsibility to make sure that our community has access to all of these new technologies. And not technology for technology's sake, but you have to be able to provide this digital access and know how to use it in order to be a successful citizen in this 21st century digital age. So it's put a lot more um, onus on us and our staff to provide the training and to really um, make sure that we are holding up what we need to do to prepare our community for what is tomorrow. My heart is in the library. I really feel that from its very inception, it was meant to be a place where people could come and I think books are valuable. I think it's our history. I think it's our future. Reading, it's, it's life. <laughs> it's important. Um, we're always going to be about literacies, old and new, um, but we really are listening to our community and seeing what they're telling us about what's next. I can't imagine my world without a library in it. I think that libraries really have the power to change lives and uh, I know that from my own personal story and I heard dozens and dozens of stories during my career about how libraries made a difference in people's lives. Knowledge is power, you know, and it doesn't, um, as long as you have that knowledge, you have power to change whatever you choose to change. And that's why libraries are valuable.